discrimination. Other social security programs like social security disability right. insurance and for Medi-Cal, for the Medi-Cal programs where disability is a criterion. So DDS, not to be confused with the Department of Developmental Services DDS. So when I refer to DDS, I'm referring to this. Um, when my packet gets to DDS, it's going to be assigned to an analyst, and that person is going to make the disability determination if I'm below the age of 65, which I am. So um, what I want to do is I want to find out from Social Security if the packet is there and what office they sent it to, because I want to get a hold of that analyst. And I want to have a conversation with the analyst. I want to know what the analyst needs, like what's missing from my file. It's possible that the analyst has, has sent requests to the doctors I put in, in my application and hasn't heard from my doctors. I'll say to the analyst, you know what, let me get that information for you. Let me help you. Let me help you get what you need. And that's what I would do. I would want to make sure that the analyst has everything that is necessary for the analyst to make a decision about whether or not I am disabled. And it's possible that the analyst may want me to be examined by one of their doctors. So that's called a consultative exam. And I have to go and do it. I mean, I do have to cooperate with the program. So that's a possibility. And I've included the different um, DDS offices in the state of California, but you can find out from Social Security what office your file was sent to so that you can get a hold of the analyst um, and become their friend um, and help them to get what they need. So let's talk about the definitions of disability. I'm also going to talk about presumptive eligibility and compassionate allowances. And you've got all the material you're going to get, it's a lot of material, and you're going to get all of the links. Can you all put, please mute yourself so that um, there's no background noise? Thank you. So what is the definition of disability? There are two, there are actually three definitions. One is for people who are applying for SSI based on blindness, and you have to be statutorily blind in order to be found disabled. But aside from that, any other disability, there's an adult definition and a child definition. The adult definition is that you are unable to engage in substantial gainful activity. We call it SGA because of your disabilities, which are expected to last at least 12 consecutive months or result in your death. What is substantial gainful activity? It's a dollar amount. And for this year, Substantial gainful activity, if, if you are applying for, not because of blindness, it's $1,470. So if you are working and grossing gross $1,470, guess what? You are not disabled because you can engage and you are engaging in substantial gainful activity. Um, so it's all based on whether you can engage in substantial gainful activity. It's based on work. Um, whereas the definition of, of a child to be disabled, you've got to show that the disabilities um, uh, cause marked and severe functional limitations that are expected to last at least 12 continuous months or result in the death of the child. So what happens when children uh, have been receiving SSI and they turn 18. Well, guess what? They're going to get a letter from Social Security saying, we've got to redetermine whether you continue to be qualified, you qualify for SSI, whether you continue to be disabled. Why? Because now they're going to apply a new definition of disability. They're going to apply the adult definition of disability. And we get calls from parents usually saying, I don't get it. My son turned 18, his condition didn't all of a sudden get better. He's still the same. I don't understand why they say after having received SSI for all these years, suddenly at age 18, he's not disabled. And I have to explain that they're now applying a different definition of disability. It's possible that they're right about their decision. It's possible that they're wrong about their decision. 
And I always say, look, you know, you might want to consult with an attorney who does this kind of work. There are attorneys and we have a referral list, but you can, there are many attorneys who do this kind of work. All they do is help people establish their social security benefits. Have a consultation with one of these attorneys, bring all of the medical evidence, everything that you submitted and more hopefully, so that the attorney can decide whether or not you have a good case. And by the way, the attorneys will only take good cases because they only get paid if they win. So when yeah. you're looking for an attorney, you got to make sure that you're going to sell your case to the attorney, right? Because, um, you know, not win, no money. So, um, so that's what could happen. Um, and it's important to know these definitions. So you've got, you're going to get all of this. And these are substantial gainful activities for prior years. Um, and then this is the definition of disability for someone who's applying for um, SSI, Social Security Disability Insurance, Medi-Cal based on um, um, So let's talk about presumptive disability or eligibility. There are some conditions that they that more likely than not are going to be found. If you have the condition or conditions, you're going to be found disabled more likely than not. So there's these list of conditions. And so what will happen is you're if you if you fall under one of these conditions, that you're going to start getting your payments almost right away for up to six months, while DDS, the analyst, makes a final decision on disability. And you don't have to pay that money back if, if, if DDS finds that you are not disabled. So what are those conditions? Um, here they are, amputation of the leg at the hip, allegation of total deafness, total blindness, of inability to move without a wheelchair, walk, or crutches due to a longstanding condition, allegation of stroke, more than three months, right? Allegation of cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, atrophy, with marked difficulty in walking, allegation of Down syndrome, allegation of intellectual disability, or a neurodevelopmental impairment like autism spectrum disorder, with complete inability to independently perform basic self-care and the person has to be at least four years of age. There are some conditions based on weight at birth, uh, or, uh, HIV, AIDS, um, spinal cord, uh, end-stage renal failure, allegation of Lou Gehrig's disease. So these, these disabilities um, are found, there, you know, there's a, a strong presumption that you're going to be found disabled now. There's something called compassionate allowances. And so if your condition is in the list of compassionate allowances, so let's say that I have acute leukemia. So I would click on to acute leukemia or A and find acute leukemia and read up on what it what what how what I have to prove under acute leukemia to be considered uh, eligible under the compassionate allowance list. Because if, if I meet the cr criteria under acute leukemia, I am going to be found disabled. These are conditions where you will be found disabled. And, and the analyst at DDS will quickly do the disability determination. Um, there are a lot of disabilities. As you can see, this is just an example of the A categories. Um, and it goes on and on. And I wanted to give you guys an example of what it looks like. So now what we're going to do is the analyst on my case is ready to determine whether I am disabled. And so we're going to go through the sequential analysis. Okay. Um, so of course, it, it, there are different rules for blindness because you're either statutorily blind or not, right? Um, but, um, and there's more uh, information on rules for blindness there, but I'm, I'm focusing on the other disabilities because that's the majority of people who are applying. So 
and my disability, let's say I've got a mental health disability and a physical disability. Um, and so the first question that the analyst will ask himself is, Marie, is Maria working at, at the level of substantial gainful activity? In other words, am I working and earning at least $1,470 growth per month? Because if I am, guess what? That's the end of the analysis. I am not disabled. Despite, despite the fact that I have disabilities, I will be found not to be disabled. But let's say that I am not working substantial gainful activity. The next question is, is Maria's condition severe? In other words, is my condition expected to last at least 12 consecutive months or result in my death? Let's say that I was involved in a really bad accident I fractured my arms in different places. My doctor said to me, you know, Maria, between recovery and physical therapy, you're not, you're not, you know, you're, it's going to take about 11 months for you to get better and be, be able to go back to work. Well, if that's the case, and that's the information that the analyst has in front of him, him there, I'm not going to be found disabled because my condition is not going to last at least 12 consecutive months. Now, if I get closer to that 11th month and suddenly I'm permanently disabled because my condition never got better, then I would, you know, I might want to, if my case is still open, I would want to submit that to the analyst or reapply. Um, or maybe I've appealed the decision and it would be just including that evidence perhaps. But, um, but let's say that my condition is severe. So the next question the analyst will ask is, is Maria's condition or conditions, remember I have a mental health disability and a physical disability, so are my conditions in the listing of impairments? The listing of impairments is also called the blue book. And I'm gonna take you guys to what it looks like online. It's not this blue book. <laughs> So uh, why is it called the blue book? Because it, if you get a physical copy of it, it's blue. Um, so this is the listing of impairments in the blue book. And I would go to adult listings. And this is what the adult looks of it, adult, adult listings looks like. It's um, broken down into different um, um, systems. So let's say that my system is a, uh, um, my broken arms, musculoskeletal disorders. I, the analyst is going to look up my disabilities based on what systems they are, and if if I if my disabilities meet the criteria that that the criteria in the blue book, then um, even if one condition meets the criteria of the blue book, then I will be found disabled. That's the end of the analysis. Um, for children, uh, the analyst is going to look at the blue book to see if the child, you know, aside from presumptive eligibility or compassionate allowances, the, um, the analyst is going to look at the blue book for a child. And if the, if the child's condition or conditions doesn't meet the blue book, then they're going to look at something different. And I'll show you what that is a little later. So let's say that my condition is not my conditions don't meet the listing of impairments, the criteria and the listing of impairments. Then the analyst goes to the fourth question, which is, can Maria do the same work she did before? Well, I can't use my hands anymore, and I do a lot of computer work. And but guess what? I can. I, there's there's technology out there that would allow me to do my work without using my hands. And so, yeah, I can do the same work I did before with reasonable accommodations from my employer. So I don't think I'm going to be found out uh, disabled. But let's say that I can't do the same work that I did before. So the last, um, and especially if you've never worked before, there's nothing to do there, right? Um, so then the analyst will go to the last question, and that is, can Maria do any other type of work given my, her education, her age, her skills, um, her functional limitations, physical and mental functional limitations? And at this point, 
um, the analyst may be working with a vocational rehab expert, and that vocational rehab expert will review my case, my medical history, et cetera, et cetera. And it's possible that that rehab analyst may come up with a list of 10 jobs I can do despite my disability. Uh, and at that point, the analyst will say, well, Maria can do other types of work given her all these other given her age, education, et cetera, um, even given her functional limitations. And so therefore we're gonna find that she is not disabled. So you can see how it's possible for an analyst get to get to the last step and find that the person is not disabled because they can do um, work despite their disabilities. So just because you're disabled doesn't mean that you cannot work. There are many people with disabilities who are able to work with or without reasonable accommodations. Um, and so um, it's really important to understand the sequential analysis. Um, so, you know, you've got several chances perhaps of be being found disabled, maybe under presumptive eligibility, compassionate allowances, maybe under the blue book listings. But if that all those fail, then the analyst is going to go down to question number four to question number five in the sequential analysis. I've given you some um, some information on the role of vocational experts. Should you have to go to hearing because you've been denied um, SSI, for example, because you're not found to be disabled. So this is some information and you can look it up. There's a link to this information, but I actually like this one better, Vocational Expert Handbook, because it does, it takes you through like, you know, uh, what is a vocational expert? What's a judge? What does disability mean? What happens at a hearing with a judge? The different levels of appeal, the responsibilities of a vocational expert um, at the hearing, pre-hearing preparation, et cetera, et cetera. So, and the sequential analysis that we went through. So it's a really good publication um, because what's gonna happen at a hearing? In my case, I'm gonna have to appeal if I want to. And if I get to an administrative law judge hearing, I'm going to have to prove to the judge that I cannot do those 10 jobs. I could say to the judge, I could give testimony. I could introduce rep reports or letters from my doctors or specialists that say, no, she cannot do this job. She cannot do the other job. Um, I may even, you know, if I'm able to hire my own vocational rehab expert to, um, you know, to give another opinion, hopefully, um, and to help me um, formulate the questions so that when I to cross examine their vocational expert, right? Because you can use experts to help you frame your cross examination questions of their experts. Um, so this is the the blue book listing of impairments, and note that there's a childhood child listing of impairments too. Um, a lot of what I've said in the yeah, I've said so far is comes from the blue book. Now, let's say for example, let's talk about children for a moment. So we're talking about anyone below the age of eighteen. So, um, so if the um, the child's disability or disabilities doesn't meet the listing of impairments, um, then um, what they're looking for is whether uh, what uh, what their disabilities, whether their disabilities are functionally functionally equivalent to the listing of impairments. And so they're looking at domains. And this is the information that the analyst is going to need in order to figure it out. The domains are the ability of the child to acquire or use information, attend complete tasks, interact with others, move objects, um, manipulate objects, caring for self, and a general category of health and well-being. So if you're a parent applying for SSI for your minor child, you know, maybe the IEP has this information. Maybe the 
IPP, if your child is a regional center, would have this information. But if not, you need to, you're going to need to provide information with the application, perhaps, that addresses each of these domains. Because this is the, inf if, so if the child's list is, doesn't meet the listing of impairments, they're going to be looking at these domains. And they're, they're going to need information that shows, um, that talks about all of this, right? And remember that the childhood definition is severe and marked functional limitations in these areas. So this, I'm not going to go through this document. You can read it um, at your leisure, but there's a lot of really good information if you are applying for a child. Um, so um, you're going to get that now. I want to talk about a couple of forms that I think are really important. You're not going to get these forms when you uh, get your application to apply or when you you know, obtain your application to apply for the SSI. These forms are really used by the analysts when they need more information, when they're trying to figure out whether you can work and what, and what work you can do, right? So one is called the physical residual functional capacity form. And then the other one is the mental residual capacity form. And so this is a form that you would want to have filled out by a doctor who knows the person. Um, and the questions in the physical residual capacity form go, goes to, um, to work. Like the first category is exertional limitations. Can Maria occasionally lift and or carry less than 10 pounds, 10 pounds, 20 pounds. But let's say that I can I can carry uh, up to five pounds for 10 minutes and after that my wrists start to swell. Well, my doctor would check off less than 10 pounds, but she can write after that, Maria can only lift up to five pounds for 10 minutes. And after that, her hands start to swell because that gives the analyst a better idea of what my real functional limitations are. It's not less than 10 pounds, it's even worse than that. Um, so um, if you are having a, you know, if you're gonna do this, you really need to sit down with the person who's going to fill it out, the doctor who's gonna fill it out, because I can tell you, if I were to ask my doctor to fill out this form and the next one, the mental, physical functional physical functional capacity form, my doctor wouldn't know how to fill this out because I don't talk to my doctor about these things. So you you know you really need to, to make sure that this is filled out properly, that the doctor understands what this is for, and that you know that the that the information be as accurate as possible, right? Um, and so it goes into frequently lifting, standing or walking, sitting, pushing or pulling. Uh, then doctor can put a lot more here. Uh, my ability to climb, to balance, to stoop, to kneel, crouch, to crawl. Um, all of this is about doing work, right? Reaching in all directions, handling, manipulating, fingering, feeling. My visual limitations, what are they? My communicative limitations, my environmental limitations. Am I, am I a person who can work in extreme cold, extreme heat, wetness, humidity, noise? Um, all really important to figure out what kinds of jobs I can do, right? Whether I can do the job I was doing before or whether I can do any other job. So this is a really important form that I would include with my application. Um, if, if you didn't do it, then you can always have, I mean, you know, and it's possible that the analyst already asked one of your doctors to fill out these forms. You would wanna look, if you're going to a hearing, for example, you would wanna look at your file at the, fair, at the hearing office to see what's in there. And if it's not in there, um, you would want to, I would get it as a as a, introduce it as evidence as to my physical and mental residual functional capacity. So this is the mental residual functional capacity form, and so it talks about my my ability to understand and memorize, sustain concentration and persistence. It talks about social interaction. If I am a person that because of my disability I do not 
so interact socially. They can't say that I can they I can do a job as a customer service person. That would be the worst thing uh, because of my disability. So I'll my bit my ability to adapt situations um, and so forth. So you see that all of these questions in these forms are really to try to figure out what kinds of jobs I can do and if I can do the job I did before. So we have spent, oh, this is record time, maybe about 30 minutes talking about disability, just that one criterion. We still have to talk about income, resources, qualified alien status, and other things. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to stop. Um, Okay, so we've talked about disability, if you're below the age of 65, as a criterion that needs to be met. Now we're going to talk about income, and we're going to talk about something called countable income. Because as you'll see, SSI doesn't count all in, it doesn't even count gross income, it takes gross income, and, it, it, and it, there are deductions that you can do to gross income. We're going to talk about deeming, and then we're going to look at the benefit levels for 2023. Not everyone gets the same amount. So income can be from earnings. It could be unearned income, interest income, dividends. Maybe you're receiving another form of social security benefits, a pension, a private uh, a disability plan, whatever it is, uh, is considered unearned income. There's in-kind income which, um, and we're gonna put a publication that you should read uh, from Justice and Aging in chat because in-kind income is a complicated, could be a very complicated issue depending on the facts of your case. So when you're 18 or over SSI and you're living with other people, SSI expects you to be paying your fair share of food and or shelter expenses. And if you're not, then SSI says, well, then the people that you're in the household are helping you with food and shelter, and that has a dollar value. And they use two formulas, and you know they will, de depending on the formula that they use, they'll deduct that amount of money from the SSI that you would have, you would have gotten right that you were entitled to. So that's called in-kind support and maintenance. There's a really great publication that you guys will now have access to. And it doesn't matter if you're living with your parents or family, you're living with others. And so you have to meet your fair share of food and shelter expenses. Uh, deemed income. So if you're a minor applying, um, you're a spouse applying, um, uh, or you've been sponsored to become a lawful permanent resident, um, and the sponsor agreed to take care of you, and now you're here applying for SSI. Um, the income and resources, for example, of the parent with whom the child is living will be counted as if it were the child's income and resources. And that can disqualify the child from getting any SSI, um, despite the fact that the child may have been found disabled by DDS. And it's only when the child turns 18 that deeming ends. So if I'm a, if I'm married and I apply for um, SSI, my spouse's income and resources will count as if they were mine, and it could disqualify me from getting any SSI. It doesn't matter that my husband doesn't give me anything, or like you know I don't benefit at all financially or whatever from you know from him, but that's what's going to happen, and that's called deeming income and resources. Same same rule income and resources will be deemed in those situations and it can disqualify you from getting any SSI. Um, so generally speaking, when we're talking about SSI, there are deductions to gross income. So if you have any unearned income, SSI will allow you to deduct $20 to get to countable income. If you have earnings, you get to deduct $65 from your gross income, divide that by half, and that becomes countable income. If you have blind work expenses or impairment-related work expenses, these are 
out-of-pocket expenses that you incur every month to be able to work, you can even deduct those from your, um, your gross income. And there's a formula to follow. Um, and there are things that are just not counted by the SSI program as income. So income tax refunds, home energy assistance, um, lots of other things. These are just examples of things that are not counted um, as income. And there are uh, some examples of how they deduct, what are the, deduct, the deductions are to, grow, to income and to unearned income that you can look at there. Um, and we've got child deeming information here for you guys to have too. Um, so people always ask, well, how much can I get in SSI? And I say, you know what? It depends on a number of factors. Are you applying, are you getting SSI based on blindness or another disability? What is your live, it, it, have you been assigned to independent living status or are you living in the household of another status? Are you a minor? Are you a minor living with parent? Are you a minor be, uh, considered living in the household of another? Are you an independent living status but you have no cooking facilities? So you see that the amounts are different based on all of those factors. Um, and then they have combinations of couples who apply for SSI. If both of them are applying based on blindness or one is ba applying based on blindness and the other one is applying based on another disability. So you've got the different amounts. So you see how it differs. Now, let me give you an example of countable income, how it affects SSI. So independent living status doesn't mean I live alone. I can be living with other people, but let's say um, I have rental liability. I'm on the rental agreement, right? So I'm in independent living status and I'm, I've applied based on a physical disability. So um, the most I can get in SSI every month is $1,133.73. And let's say that I have earned income and unearned income. Um, and it totals my countable income after all of my deductions, it totals $1,200. Will I get any SSI? Does anyone want to put it in chat? Yes or no? And Lonnie, let me know what the chat says. Did anyone answer? No, we okay. Um, okay. So if my countable income is a thousand two hundred dollars and the most I could get in SSI is one thousand one hundred and thirty three dollars and seventy three cents, my countable income is more than what I could get in SSI, and I will not get any SSI. So this is a situation where countable income is too high and I will not get any SSI. But let's say that my countable income after all of the deductions is $1,000. Will I get any SSI? I'll get some. So what's going to happen is SSI is going to take the $1,133.73, deduct my countable income of $1,000. So I am going to get that month $133.73 in SSI. My countable income is less than the SSI amount and my countable income is subtracted from the SSI amount to give me what I'm gonna get that month in SSI. And as long as I get a dollar of SSI, I still get my full scope Medi-Cal. So let's talk about countable resources. Because again, not all, not everything you have is counted as a resource for the SSI program. But what are resources? Cash is counted. Bank money you have in the bank account is counted. Stocks, funds, bonds, land, life insurance under certain circumstances, some personal property, you want some vehicles. Um, Resources are deemed also in the situation of a minor child, spouse, or sponsored person. Um, they'll be deemed to these to the applicants. SSI has a resource limit. So if I'm applying for SSI, I can't have more than $2,000 in countable resources. If I have more than that, 
then I'm over-resourced and I'm not going to get any SSI. For a couple applying, they can have up to $3,000 in countable resources. So things that are not counted as resources include the home that you own and live in. Like if you're in California and you bought your home for $50,000 and now it's worth $3 million, which could be the case, um, that's okay. That's not going to count as a resource. One vehicle, regardless of the value, is not going to count as a resource. But if you need another vehicle to work, not to go to work, but you need your car to work, that's not counted as a resource. Or the tools of your trade needed to work, that's not going to count as a resource. Uh, life insurance policies with a face value of $1,500 or less are not counted. Burial spaces for you and your immediate family are not counted. Burial funds. For you and your spouse, each valued at fifteen hundred or less is not counted, um, et cetera, et cetera. Cat, so Cal Able accounts. Um, if you if you have a Cal Able account and you're receiving SSI, you can have up to a hundred thousand dollars in that Able account to use to on qualified disability expenses to buy a home, remodel your home, buy a car, get an education, go on a vacation get a, a, a spa membership, whatever you want that's, a, that's considered a qualified disability expense. And it having that money in the CalAble account is not gonna affect your SSI at all. That's why I think CalAble is such a great program for people, especially on SSI, because if you, if you don't have a CalAble account, the most you can have, like if I don't have a CalAble account, um, the most I can have is $2,000 in countable resources. But if I have a CalAble account and I'm on SSI, I could have up to $100,000 in my CalAble account and it won't count as a resource. Um, other things that don't count as resources. Um, so you can, you're going to have the ability to look at all of this. Um, and again, if you ever have any questions, you can always call us. Um, there are organizations who do this kind of work too, so we're not the only ones. Legal aid may, may help people with SSI. I don't know, you have to check your local legal aid um, organization. So we've talked about disability for anyone under the age of 65. Countable income has to be low or none. Countable resources have to be low or none. Now we're going to look at qualified alien status because you have to be a qualified alien. Um, so a qualified alien, there's an, I'm not an immigration expert. When I did do cases, um, uh, I worked with uh, an organization, uh, a, a National Immigration Law Center. They have experts in immigration who also are experts in benefits. And so I would work with them on cases that involved um, immigration status. Um, so these are the immigration statuses that make you a qualified alien, someone who's a refugee admitted under Section 207 of the Immigration and Nationalization Act. I mean, I don't know what these all mean. I know what a refugee means, but I'm not, I'm not familiar with Section 207 or Section 208 for uh, granted asylum, deportation being withheld. So there are these categories of people who are considered to be qualified aliens. By the way, when you become a lawful permanent resident, you cannot apply for SSI for at least the first five years because you can't get benefits where the federal government is participating. Um, but in California, we have a program called Cash Assistance for Immigrants that gives a benefit equal to what you would get in SSI for people in that status. And I think statuses. so California does have a program um, that is very similar to the SSI program for people who, because of their immigration status, can't get SSI, especially during those first five years. So there's a lot of information here um, on who is a qualified immigrant um, et cetera. Rights and responsibilities, you're gonna have um, a handout that talks about your rights, which are great, um, but I really wanna focus on your responsibilities because this is where people get into trouble with SSI. Um, because remember, what 
your eligibility for SSI and how much you get in SSI is based on income and resources and whether you're a qualified immigrant, whether you are disabled, whether you're a California resident. So when these things change, they can, the, you know, your life situations can affect your eligibility for SSI or how much you get um, that particular month. So your reporting responsibilities are important. And so when you move, when someone moves into your home, leaves your home, when you when you're start working, uh, when there's a change in your income. So you can imagine people who whose income fluctuates every 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 month, they're having to report their income every month. But the problem is it, it lies here. When I if I report my income this month, because I'm going to know what my income is this month by the 10th of the following month, I've already gotten my check this month but I reported my income for this month in July because I have, I won't know until the end of the month, June, how much I made in July. So, but I've been, I've, I got my June check based on wrong information because my income is different in June. So they're basing it, SSI is basing what they're giving me in June on past information. Because what I get in June is based on what I earned in June or what my income was in June. So I report my income in July and the changes don't, and then it takes a while for SSI to process that information. And so I'm going to get a notice from SSI saying we overpaid you, Maria, in June because your income was greater than what we had calculated your income to be based on the information we had and therefore you owe us money. And you can imagine for someone who has income that changes every month, how horrible it could be to have to deal with this. So I say to people, look, you know, think about an income level that will still get you some SSI, but won't put you in a situation where you're facing a bunch of overpayments. And it's possible that you, if you do that, that maybe SSI may have underpaid you. And it's better for SSI to owe you money than to you owe them money and have to pay them back. Um, but anyway, so um, there are a lot of things that need to, when you marry, you've got to report because suddenly your spouse's income and resources are going to count. And that can kick you off the program or reduce your SSI. Um, when you change your name, when you become eligible for other benefits, when you enter an institution, uh, when you leave the United States and return, if you're out of the U.S. for 30 consecutive days, um, you're going, your, your SSI will be suspended. 12 months of suspension on the 13th month, your SSI is terminated and you have to reapply. Um, your immigration status changes, your sponsor's income resources and the sponsor's spouse's income and resources changes. So there's a lot of reporting to do, right? Oh, and the list goes on. Okay, reminders. Um, so you'll be able to look at this. And by the way, when you get on SSI, um, my understanding is that they give you information on your reporting responsibilities, but you know, what do you do with that information? You, you don't realize how important it is until you, you get that first notice saying we overpaid you or you no longer qualify for um, SSI. So um, the application process, you can apply in various ways. You can apply online. You can call us, call them and apply. You can set up an appointment for someone at Social Security to help you fill out the application. Um, personally, I would get the paper form of the application and, it with, and I would sit down and with time, I would fill it out. I would get all the documentation that I have that's relatively current um, and attach it with my application. 
I would have my doctors fill out the physical functional residual capacity form, the mental functional residual capacity form. After submitting that, I would get a hold of DDS and work with the analyst to make sure that the analyst has everything that he or she needs so that I can be found disabled, right? That's the whole goal. Now, let's say that um, I get I get a letter from Social SSI saying, Maria, you do not qualify for SSI. You are, we found that you're not disabled. Or and or I also don't qualify for SSI because maybe I'm over income, over resourced. I'm not, I don't have the the proper qualified alien status. Um, and by the way, you know how DDS does the disability determination? Social Security does the other criteria determination. So income resources, qualified alien status, California residency, that Social Security does. So if I get a notice of action that tells me you're not disabled and you're over income, um, I, I have to fill out, if I want to appeal, then the first level of appeal is a reconsideration. So there's a different form to appeal a disability uh, determination. And there's another form to appeal all the other reasons. So I would be filling out the form for reconsideration based on disability. Mm -hmm. And what's gonna happen is that someone at DDS who, what, who wasn't the person who decided my case will look at my file and, and, and determine whether or not um, the analyst made a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, and so for the other reason, income, I'm over income, I, I can appeal, but it will be another form. And someone at Social Security will look at my file, not the person who decided I was over income and decide whether there was a mistake. If I lose, then my next level of appeal is to go to an administrative law judge. If I lose there, then my next level of appeal is to an appeals council, three judges. And then if I lose there, federal court. Believe me, you do not. If you can do it, if you can just be found eligible right away, that's the best case scenario. A reconsideration, they, they're usually like for other reasons other than disability, I know that the form has, do you want an informal conference? Um, do you have, do you want a formal conference or do you want a paper review? I always suggest, well, an informal conference because you'll actually be speaking to the person who's doing the reconsideration. If you do a paper reconsideration, you're not gonna be talking to anyone. Um, but anyway, so this document has a lot of information on the reconsideration process on the hearing process, how much time you have to request a hearing, et cetera, et cetera, on the appeals council and federal court. So I wanna talk about representation. Um, this is a publication that was um, put together by social security that talks about representation. So attorneys who do this, who represent people um, at hearings I think you, I don't even think you need to be an attorney to represent because I think I've known of people who aren't attorneys who represent people. Um, but um, in any event, whoever your representative is, they cannot charge you a fee unless they win. I was doing this training and some and, and a participant said, well, I found an attorney and he's charging me five thousand dollars. I said he he can't do that. What, well, who am I to say, you know, stop it, but that's illegal. Um, and um, typically these attorneys, if they win, they can only charge 25% um, of your retroactive payment um, should you win the case. Um, if they want, if the, if the representative wants any more than that, they have, they have to petition Social Security and explain to Social Security why you're asking more than the usual amount. What's What was so hard about this case that now you're asking for more fees? Um, the other thing to note is that there's a difference between fees, attorney fees and attorney costs. So let's say that I've hired an attorney to represent me and that attorney calls me up and says, you know what, Maria, 
I need you to be seen by such and such an expert. And I need a report from this person. And I need this person to testify at the hearing if the report is favorable, right, to you. Um, but it's not something that my health insurance company is going to pay for. It's up to me. I have to bear the cost. And let's say that the attorney says to me, Maria, it's going to be about $5,000 for all of this. And believe me, that's cheap. Um, and I'm like, wow, that's a lot of money. And the attorney might upfront the cost, but the retainer will say the agreement between the attorney and, you know, that I signed with the attorney will say that although the attorney may upfront the cost at the end of the day, whether I win or lose my case, I have to reimburse that attorney or the attorney may say, I'm not for, I'm not, I'm not going to upfront the cost. It's something that you're just going to have to pay. Um, and so I'm, you know, if this, if, if this report is really important, if this information is really important for my case, you know, I would probably agree to pay, to pay the, the cost of that. There are other costs too. I may have to pay a filing fee, filing fee at court if I go to if I go to court. I mean, there are, you know there are um, there are costs that are involved in representing, and you need to talk to the attorney uh, about what those costs are um, versus fees. So remember, fees only get the attorney only gets when the attorney wins if the attorney wins the case. So there's a lot of good information there. Helpful suggestions. There's something I do want to tell you about. You're going to, this is what I want to tell you about. So um, if you are ever having any trouble with Social Security, the, the Social Security Administration, whatever it is, you don't, you're not hearing from them. They made a wrong decision. You know, they're, whatever the problem is you're having with Social Security, you can contact your U.S. Congress person. They're in your district. Find out who they are. Just type in find my US Congress person and you're type in your your zip code and you'll find out who that person is. These Congress people have staff in their offices who help constituents with their social security issues. So I've referred clients to their local co U.S. Congress person's office. They usually they usually require that you fill out a form with information explaining the issue. Um, and what they do is they have people within Social Security who they can contact to deal with, you know, to figure out the issue and to help. I had a case where um, the... Um, the father was using the Cal Able account to help the son. It's the son's Cal Able account, but so the father was taking money out of, he was the authorized representative for that account, was taking money out of the account to help pay for the for his adult son's fair share of food and shelter so that he wouldn't be assessed in kind support and maintenance. And the father started doing this and he went to Social Security to make sure that he was doing this right. And he got all kinds of answers. Yes, you're doing it right. No, you can't do that. He was all confused. In the meantime, his son was being assessed in kind support and maintenance. And so his benefit amount was being deemed every month reduced because of this. And so um, I said, well, one of the things, let's appeal. So I was going to represent him at the hearing. And I said, let's I want you to contact your US Congress person and I want you to ask them to set up an appointment with someone at Social Security who knows what they who knows what they're doing so that we can talk about this case. And he did. He reached out to his US Congress person. They set up a call with um with a um a representative from Social Security who knew what he was doing. We talked about the case, and at the end of the call, he said, you're right, you can, you can use your CalABLE account to help pay for uh, food and shelter expenses, um, and we're going to readjust your son's SSI to give him the full amount, and he's going to be receiving a retroactive payment because we took out money. Um, we didn't have to go to hearing. 
So I always use that example because there are there, you know, it's a resource for all of you. And that's not the only case that I've, I've referred to uh, the US Congress person where they've had good results. Um, so that is there. And there's more information here. So rather than um, taking time to go through all of this, which you can, why don't we go ahead and stop the recording because we're at the end of the presentation and just take questions.